namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Aparuta de Sangamata Satawara, ye sort of one tab and moon chan to Satang. So this uh, awareness, mindfulness, a perception, apprehension, the point that includes everything or the point that excludes. So this is a reflection I've always used. Like the, we talk about one pointedness, ekagata in Pali. And in terms of uh, samatha meditation, it's a point that excludes. And in vipassana, it's a point that includes. So it's all, you know, how you, uh, a point that includes is whole, it's complete. Point that excludes is refined. So, I mean, you, you point, look at the point through samatha practice, or concentration practice on on a, on a point that's refined, that excludes all coarseness, harsh conditions, uh, unpleasantness, and, and loud noises, and all the rest. To absorb into refined point. Or the point that includes, then this is, this is like where vipassana really begins to develop, because it's uh, the Satipatthana, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, Four Noble Truths, all of that, the Anatta, the Nibbana, Sunyata, Unconditioned Unborn, all of these, uh, you know, this is, these don't come from the point ex- that excludes. You just, you develop maybe a refined conditions. And the more you refine the conditions, it's very tranquilizing and has its beauty. It arouses the, the uh, have the uh, jhana factors. Vidaka vichara piti sukha ekagata. But then ekagata in vipassana is based on samaditi or right understanding of the Four Noble Truths. <clears throat> so that's uh, the, the use of, of the point that includes or mindfulness, sati sampachanya, awareness. I use these interchangeably, and so it's not, it's not kind of, <clears throat> you know, mindfulness is this and awareness is that. I, for, as far as I'm concerned, they, the same thing. This awakened state, attention, listening, openness, receptivity to totality, to the whole or the one. So one can mean the completeness or the whole or it can mean just one thing that you know that you exclude everything else. <clears throat> Now notice the difference between refinement and uh, that comes from one pointedness on a on the point that excludes and the 
uh, liberation that comes through the point that includes. Because you, you, to, to, to recognize this is you have to be that. You have to be this consciousness itself that includes everything that you happen to be experiencing at this moment. You know, whether it's physical, internal, external, pleasure, painful, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, all the rest, all it includes everything. Everything belongs. <clears throat> so mosquitoes, I used to think, I wish God had never created any mosquitoes. <laughs> if I were God, I would never have created mosquitoes. Uh, because I don't like them, they seem to be, give diseases. And uh, you live in Thailand, they've got lots of them. <laughs> you have to learn how to live with them, because uh, monastics can't, uh, can't intentionally kill anything. So mosquitoes belong, and everything else, uh, you know, good, bad, right, wrong, heaven, hell. So in this way, by, by reflecting in this way, you suddenly realize you don't have to spend this time trying to control your mind or, or, or try to, you know, get into a refined state of consciousness through controlling and through excluding, but you're welcoming this because everything belongs. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a different attitude. The thing I found about being refined is that uh, I quite like it, but it also makes life more painful because most of daily life is not that refined. <laughs> so you get addicted to refinement and then you, you feel, oh, I can't. I mean, I'm going on fast and getting and meditating and getting so refined I didn't want to eat anymore. Eating was too coarse. <laughs> but eventually I had to eat again just to, for the needs of the body. Now in the Sound of silence or nada, it's called in Sanskrit nada or sound. Uh, sound of silence. Now people have various ways of trying to figure what this is. Like some people think it's your blood vessels or your nervous system. I've heard all kinds of explanations. Some of it just to dismiss it, you know, it's just your blood vessels. As if you could hear your own blood vessels and, or your nervous system. Uh, you know, this was, uh, you know, even if it is, it doesn't really matter what it is because I see it strictly in a functional way. <clears throat> it works, you know, as I suggest using it, it works because by, by recognizing this sound of silence and, and you develop awareness that connects. It isn't just the momentary awareness or fragmentary of, you know, this and that and then forgetting and going on to the next. You, be, you have this sense of continuity, connectedness, and the sense of the sakyaditi drops away. Like if you really learn to trust the sound of silence by resting in it, then if there's awareness, you're fully present, but this, uh, the thinking process will cease, will stop. You know, you're the, the chattering, going, one thought going on to the next, it'll cease. And you're still fully attentive, fully present, you're not in a trance, you're not in a refined, absorbed state. It's quite ordinary, but it's empty. It's, I, you know, the, 
this, this sense of me as a person, I have to start thinking again. I am experiencing the sound of silence, or is it the blood vessels in my head or the nerves in my body that I'm experiencing? Then what is it, just another condition you dismiss as a Nietzsche Dukkanata? Easy peasy, isn't it? <laughs> just get rid of it like that. Because most people don't know what it is, and they don't, you know, they dismiss it. So a Nietzsche Dukkanata can be just another way of dismissing things that every, all conditions are a Nietzsche. It's just your blood vessels. When you die and your blood stops flowing, then it packs up, you can't hear it anymore. When you're dead, I don't know what happens, <laughs> tell the truth. <clears throat> But for this moment here, and now sitting here on this mat, you know, it's by resting in this, it is peaceful. Now in uh, Thailand, when somebody dies, the custom is to invite monks to, to, to the visit the corpse, and we chant this little reflection. Anichavada Sankara Ubatavaya Tamino Ubachitavani Ruchanti De Sangu Basamosuko. And this translate it's very in you know, two lines. And and it's about it's just uh, observing the way it is. Uh, all conditions are impermanent. Anicha impermanent, vada, sankara, sankara conditions, ubhatavaya, tamino, they arise and cease, and in their cessation is peace. Now that's an interesting one, you know, this is a, about a, a body, a dead corpse, you know, or a, you don't have to say dead corpse, a corpse. <laughs> All corpses are dead. <laughs> But in terms of the here and now, this is like in investigating the Four Noble Truths, this uh, sense of uh, the ego, the Sakya Ditti arising and ceasing. When we let the Sakya Ditti cease, it's dead, it dies, and it's peaceful when there's no self. Anatta is peacefulness. Well, contemplate how your ego, the sense of yourself, is always, you know, makes you self-conscious. Uh, there's always this, uh, there's so much complexity around being somebody. And, you know, in a society, and we live in a competitive society. So, you know, to be somebody is, is this, that sense of comparing yourself. There's always somebody better higher or lower. Even though we pride ourselves, we don't have a class system, we don't hold to, uh, you know, the snobbishness of a class system or an aristocracy or that. We still have, you know, we still have this Sakya Ditti, which, uh, you know, we want to feel, you know, I want to feel I'm superior. Or then because of that, then I feel inferior when somebody is better off, better looking, more clever than I am. Somebody with a lot of power and authority, I feel, oh, I've got to be careful because I feel, you know, threatened by some strong, confident, powerful person who's obviously better than me. That's Sakya Ditti. Or I can, you know, have the same, I, somebody I look down on, and that person is you know, silly person, Dismiss him is uh, Sakya Ditti. And so the, the self is, a, is always this, this blind attachment to the conditioned self. Sakya Ditti is, is, uh, is never peaceful, it never takes you to peace. Now you're talking about uh, developing, like in, for worldly happiness, worldly success, and, and in uh, Thailand, for example, they're very, 
you know, they tell if you if you don't if you're not interested in nibbana, and you don't particularly you would still want to live or be reborn again, uh, maybe you like to be reborn as a devada. That's uh, you know that's a little more refined than being human. Uh, Devadas are beautiful and live for 84,000 eons. Or some live for 84 million eons. And, uh, and in, in unmitigated happiness and bliss. That sounds very pleasant, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, who knows? I'm not saying it's true or false, but remember, 84 million eons of bliss might go by very quickly. <laughs> because you don't have any suffering. What, what makes our lives go drag is when we're suffering, <laughs> isn't it? When we're in a state of bliss, then time just almost doesn't exist. So, you know, to the, in the Buddhist sense, you, you, Dana Sila. This is a way of living in the world in a good way for worldly happiness, for worldly success, for happy family relationships, for being able to make friends and get along in, with your neighbors and, and uh, work fellows and so forth. You're, you know, to be a generous, good-hearted person that's morally dependable, you know, who, who does it, you know, who one can trust and respect, then that also increases a sense of, of you know, you respect yourself. You increase the sense of your self-worth as a person through developing good qualities. So this is to be praised, you know, this is not to be uh, dismissed or despised, because not everybody sees the, the feels the urge to be liberated. Sometimes we like the world a lot, and we just want to be reborn again. Uh, many of us uh, became world weary at an early age. I think I was. I think uh, what you call an old soul. I think I. I must have had millions of previous lives. So this one, you know, I was born, uh, uh, not a new soul, but an old one born at this time. The whole aim is to, you know, I don't, I don't want worldly happiness. <laughs> I mean, if it happens, fine, but it's not what I'm going to dedicate my life to, is making myself happy. So th this is uh, my interest, spiritual interest, has always been in liberation, freedom from suffering. So in psychology, modern psychology, they talk about developing self-respect, positive sense of self, uh, not to you know, because there's so much self-disparagement, tendencies to, to disparage or criticize yourself. And uh, this is also, uh, you know, this is also quite dishonest. Like, we can, we can just make conscious all our weaknesses, faults, and dismiss our virtues. So Ajahn Chah, you know, encouraged me when I first met him to contemplate my own goodness, my virtuousness. And actually I found that, you know, I'd never thought of it before. It's a strange, suddenly, you know, my virtuousness, I never thought of myself as virtuous. I always thought of myself as confused or not good enough or um, in the various negative perceptions. So, you know, then, then you think of it as, uh, oh, you're going to get inflated ego, you know, you're going to, it's going to go to your head, I'm going to think, I'm so wonderful and virtuous. But that isn't it, it's not Sakya Ditti, you know, I'm just trying to convince myself I'm, 
a virtuous, wonderful guy. It's about admitting what, you know, looking honestly at your, you know, what you love in life. Do you love evil and torture and lying and, and, and harming others? Do you get great pleasure out of, out of torturing other people and watching them suffer? Do you move towards all that is mean and nasty in the world, the mafia, the criminal world? Uh, you feel attracted to, uh, and you know, you, none of you would be here if that was what you were fascinated with. This is not the place to, to look for evil. So, so this is, uh, you know, the very thing that impels you to spend ten days in noble silence, sitting with aching knees and so forth, that's, that's something to respect yourself for, isn't it? Just on the le level of, of self-respect, developing a positive sense of your self-worth, is not to be dis discouraged, it's helpful. So this is, um, you know, at least for worldly happiness, I advise this. Now if you're, but also there is bhavana, so there's dana, sila, morality, and bhavana, which is meditation. Or we translate that as meditation. And bhavana actually means developing the Eightfold Path. You know, bhavana is about stream entry, cultivating mindfulness. And bhavana is a Pali word, but it also is used in Thai just like for meditation. We say bhavana, in monks that are meditation teachers usually have names like bhavana. And it's because it's a, it means one who's developing mindfulness cultivating. So, so the dana sila pavana, this is a Pali, uh, you know, way of thinking. Dana, generosity, you can't be, take responsible for your actions of speech, at least don't be stingy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can get a lot of happiness out of just sharing wealth and other things with others. You know, if you're really stingy and self-centered, you know, you, it's a really nasty mental state to live with, isn't it? To just always think about me and what I want and keeping it all for myself. It's like Ebenezer Scrooge. So you just end up being a, a, a miserable old grump that nobody wants to be with. But generosity is, uh, you know, people oftentimes, alcoholics are quite generous. <laughs> I mean, so I'm not recommending that. But, but at least it, it does, it's, it's developing a sense of, of goodness in your life and, thing, and ways that you can respect yourself even if, you, even if you are not ready for sila or morality. Then the sila, the five precepts, these are guidelines of behavior towards yourself and the world around you, the environment. They're like non, not killing, uh, you know, you can put them on their most uh, primitive position of not killing human beings. Or as you take, want to take more responsibility, it's, it's about to not killing uh, mammals or then it goes into fish and insects and birds. I mean you can carry it on <laughs> to where like um, monastics we don't, we, don't, we don't intentionally kill anything. But notice it's a guideline, it's not a, an imperative. Sometimes morality in the Western world is a kind of moral imperative. You have to keep the moral precepts otherwise you'll go to hell. And if you kill an aunt, the bad karma will haunt you for eons of time. I mean, really scary things one can, uh, you know, intimidate you with. 
by, by you know, telling you about the, the punishments that await you for telling a lie. But see that, that this is not about frightening you into obedience and mo using morality as an intimidation to make you be good because you're afraid of being punished for, for committing sins. This is like ma very mature. You're taking on responsibility for how you live. You're, it's not because you're, you're being good and moral out of fear, but because you love to take that responsibility. And you, you, you choose to, you ask for moral precepts. I can't force you to take them. You know, it's against a monk's uh, vinaya to, to kind of tell you, you know, take the five precepts. You have to ask three times. You know, there's a traditional style. So that means, you know, you're, 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 you're wanting to take these precepts not as, uh, not from the Sakya Ditti level, but because of your love of, your, your, your respect, self-respect that, that is willing to uh, take responsibility, to develop ways of living with society, with uh, the environment that is not divisive, damaging, insensitive, So you see this, this whole Buddhist sense of leading inwards or leading onwards. It, it keeps leading you, you know, so you're not, it's not forcing, pushing, uh, intimidating, compelling, driving you. So this awakened sense of, of learning to trust yourself more, to be able to, to understand yourself and to learn from life. Even when you make terrible mistakes, you can at least learn that. You know, you don't, you know, we usually do it wrong the first time. We learn. Trial and error. We learn through trial and error. So this human condition then is, uh, is uh, this awakened human consciousness, this consciousness within the human condition. Now the word consciousness in Pali is in the five khandhas uh, Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinyana and when we chant the morning chanting we uh, Rupa, Ngani, Chang, Vedana, Anicca, Sanya, Anicca, Sankara, Anicca, Vinyana, Ngani, Chang. So it is a Body, like uh, material body, is impermanent. Feelings are impermanent. Memories are impermanent. Uh, emotions are impermanent, and consciousness is impermanent. So then we get confused because what I'm talking about is consciousness that's not impermanent. <laughs> so, I mean, this confused me for years because of the trying to fit my experience into. It, you know, into these teachings. Now these teachings are not to be grasped as ends in themselves, they're guides towards awareness. Now also in, uh, in, in there's, you know, references to vinyanang, anidasanang, anantang, sapadopabhang, consciousness, um, splendid, uh, unconditioned. So, Recognize that, that this word vinyana is, it depends on the context it's in. In other words, in, in terms of consciousness through the form of the body, that's impermanent. You know, because when the body dies, it's no longer conscious. But then, uh, but then in terms of um, here and now, like when you, you are, when you are mindful, when there's mindfulness, and you're st sustaining mindfulness, then you can have perspective, you have perspective on the rising, ceasing of your 
uh, conditioned thoughts, emotions, uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. So this is the way, you know, what I'm doing is reflecting and investigating these teachings, but applying them to experience. Now my experience of consciousness is that, that you know, sense consciousness is arising and ceasing, and ultimately consciousness of the body will cease at death. But, con- you know, consciousness through the body will cease. But I'm not having died yet, I can't speak from experience. But speaking from experience about the deaths of the conditions while the body's still breathing and conscious. This is what we learn from. You know, we don't have to kill ourselves to find out what happens when you die. Uh, you, you learn from just observing the arising and cessation of suffering. So in this Four Noble Truths, the the, the, uh, the second noble truth is the, the origin of suffering, the cause, is due to attachment to desire. <clears throat> Gama dana, bhava dana, vipava dana. And, that, and then the, the insight is to let go of desire, not to annihilate it. So consciousness, non-attached, can... can, can can receive desire. You know, desire arises and ceases according to condition. But our our refuge is in Bhutto, or Buddha mind, or Buddha consciousness, or whatever way you want to describe it. But I'm seeing it just in terms of here and now, in terms of this very moment. This is consciousness. And then, the, then the, you know, I have perspective on feeling, on emotion, on, on uh, memories, sensory impingements. And that sustains itself. It's not a created consciousness based on ignorance. Where the sense of yourself, Sakyaditi, is coming out of ignorance, of vicha, and attachment to desire. So this, that's why if this is called an awakened, awakening uh, to reality, to the real. Now the real world is generally when people refer to the real world, they, they, the real world is not the real world. I mean, we, we uh, uh, monasteries, they say, you don't live in the real world. They think we live in, in a non-real world. Um, that we're not facing reality, we're running away. This is how people see monastics, running away from the world. Um, so this is, this is the worldly mind uh, projecting onto mon- monasteries their own views and opinions. But in uh, Ajahn Chah would uh, talk a lot about conventional reality and ultimate reality. <coughs> conventional truth and ultimate truth. Samut Satcha and Paramatta Satcha. So Satcha is truth and then Samuti Satcha is the conventional truth. So it, you know, this is not a denial of the conditioned realm. And the conventions we find ourselves with, it's not a put down, but we can still can use these conventions. They you know that not it, uh, awakenness doesn't preclude the conventional reality, but includes it. So our ability to to uh, use conventions is then based on wisdom rather than habit, blind habit, and and being stuck in the conventional. Uh, the conventional world with no way of seeing it or understanding it, merely fumbling and doing the best you can to survive in it. So conventional reality, Theravada Buddhism is conventional, 
you know, American society, democracy, all these things are conventions. We have a language, so in the Ajahn Sumato, I, you know, I'm still w willing to answer to that name. You know, it'd be silly for me to say, there's no Ajahn Sumato. <laughs> you know, when you're at, at the uh, customs. They're not ready to for that one. You know. <laughs> so you you say yes, I'm Ajahn Sumato, and so, well, this is conventional reality. It's it you know it, it's the but it's it's a useful convention language, and and there's many good things about the conventional world. Beautiful things. So it's it's not a uh, you know a, a denial or an annihilation of convention. But it's learning how to use convention from the wisdom position rather than from the blind force of habit. Because even the best conventions are unsatisfying. You know, this idea that if we make the perfect society, like communism, for example, uh, you know, that the where everything is equal and there's no class system at all. There's no king uh, and everybody, there's no working class, there's no aristocracy, no nobility. Everybody is equal, getting equal pay, equal everything. And, and so that, on an ideal level, that's quite beautiful. You know, that seems fair, and that seems like something worth giving your life for. To, to get rid of, of this class system where, uh, you know, people think they're, you know, because they're aristocrats, and then they suppress, exploit the, the lower classes, the peasants, the proletariat. And then we glorify the proletariat. The working man is the hero of the age, and we've got to make sure that these uh, effete, disgusting aristocrats, we take everything away from them, strip them of everything, and make them just like us, peasants. And, you know, this is, <laughs> it, it, without wisdom, this is what happens, isn't it? It becomes a form of tyranny. So even an idealism based on a lack of wisdom becomes a tyranny, like we can see in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, what happened with an ideal that was forced on people, you know, you know compelled through fear. You, the, the means was, was fear. You're going to be punished for, for having more than somebody else. We've got to annihilate, maybe get rid of the aristocracy. Uh, just kill them off would be better, you know, because uh, there'll always be a problem in this. <laughs> so you, you end up murdering a lot of your own people and then you, you know, as if that's going to lead towards this ideal of communism. What it leads toward is tyranny and fear. Is it because the means you're using is tyrannical. It's, it's uh, evil means, you know, it's all right to kill these enemies because the, the end is worth it. So the end justifies the means. But in the law of karma, it's always, if you have the wrong means, then you don't get the, the right end. So with communism as the, as the goal, you end up with tyranny. And, uh, you know, that's because you use tyrannical means, you end up with a tyrannical society, a fear-controlled, conditioned society. So this is, you know, law of karma is, is a very good uh, way of reflecting. You know, just in your own practice here, observe that if you spend your time feeling angry and and um, being negative about everything, you're going, the, the, using uh, 
this negativity, attaching to negativity, the result is you feel depressed or negative. You're not going to get enlightened and feel happy by being attached to uh, critical thoughts, despair, uh, anger, aversion. If you want to be happy, then you think positively, power of positive thinking. All is love and life is wonderful and God loves me and everybody is wonderful and metta metta, loving kindness <laughs> and sweetness and light. All these, you'll feel very happy if you can keep it going. And so that's karma, isn't it? You, you're using positive means, you end up with a positive result. But it's still conditioned, isn't it? It's a, trying to sustain this sense of all is wonderful is hard work. Because sometimes life is not wonderful and sweetness and, and, and goodness and kindness and that. It can be nasty and mean and unfair and ugly. So that mindfulness is, allows us to receive the whole, the totality of conditioned phenomena as we're experiencing it now. You know, so our relationship to our negativity, our despair, our aversion is to be aware of it. It's like this. So the means that you're using is, is awareness, wisdom, rather than uh, just positive thinking or by suppressing uh, negative uh, feelings or thoughts. So then in um, consciousness, in terms of, of here and now, this is, this is pointing to here now. Then, the sound of silence, consciousness, are they the same thing? Or is the sound of silence really my blood vessels? Then I'm thinking again, isn't it? I'm getting caught in doubt. Somebody told me it's blood vessels. Is there, are they, and they said they heard it from somebody that, that's an authority on it. And so, or it's the nerves. And a great psychoanalyst said it's nerves, nervous system in one's ears. And so this is, uh, then, then I go immediately, if I, if I start speculating on this level, I go into doubt. But if I just use this, not a sound, or the, whatever, this vibration, or whatever way you experience it, recognize it. I don't need to define it and figure out whether, whether it's a physiological function or a transcendental one or it's cosmos or tinnitus or whatever. It is like this. And then, then to be able to use it, you know, you're, you're not trying to think about it or disregard it but you can use it. So like, my advice is to recognize it and see what happens. It's by uh, resting, you know, to, to access this, this nada, this sound of silence, is to open to it. And you, you, if you're looking for a sound of silence, you probably miss it. But if you just recognize, you know, it's a state of relax, so it's not finding or doing anything. We're great doers, aren't we? We're compulsive, obsessive doers. Meditation is something you've got to get and do. How many of you, uh, you know, work hard trying to make yourself meditate and get something from it? Uh, because this is, this is the, the uh, conditioning process of a cell. I've got to get meditation I've got to achieve and attain something out of my meditation. And sometimes teachers talk like that, you know, you've got to get this and you've got to be mindful. 
And now what does that do? If I, if I say, you have to be mindful, then you, you, you're hearing that from Sakyaditi. You know, I'm, Ajahn Tomato says I have to be mindful. And then I have to practice so many hours a day and come on several retreats a year. And, and then, so I'm going to do what Ajahn Tomato says. Now this is my, probably good advice. But you're picking it up from the Sakyaditi level, you see. This is, I, uh, Ajahn Sumedho knows what I need. I'm an unenlightened person. I still suffer from anger and jealousies and things like this. I'm a neuroses, I, all kinds of uh, emotional uh, fears and anxieties. And so I'm obviously not enlightened. Ajahn Sumedho, now look at him, he's so confident sitting there. And uh, he knows, you know, he's better than I am. And he's been at it longer, so he knows what I need. Now this is, this is, you know, this is, you're creating yourself and your relationship to your projections of me. So this is just the way it is. And I'm not saying it's, not to do this, but if you do it, to be aware of it as it's you creating. Listen to yourself, your, your own way of seeing yourself. Listen to, get to know Sakya Ditti and all its permutations and variations. So that that which is aware of Sakya Ditti It's conscious, isn't it? Consciousness is still operating when there's no Sakya Ditti. It doesn't cease when Sakya Ditti's gone, I'm unconscious. <laughs> you know, I don't drop dead when, when my ego drops away or go into a trance. But I'm more alert. There's more, the mindfulness is, is, can, has sustain, self-sustaining. It, it, you know, it's, 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 it's not just, you know, fragmented by the conditions that I'm experiencing. So one of these notes is, uh, we're taught that awareness arises and passes away with the objects that it known it is, like its object condition. You speak of pure awareness that is unconditioned. Can you talk about this and so forth? This is what I'm doing. So, <laughs> so this. Now, now this is trusting yourself because you know mindfulness of a condition. A condition arises and ceases. Yes. And 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 the, the consciousness. The, the, but con, the, look at consciousness not as ceasing when the conditions cease. But the sense uh, consciousness ceases with it, but not consciousness. So uh, consciousness, you know, is empty. It doesn't need an object. It's natural. And in, uh, in Thai, uh, culture, they usually refer to consciousness as the jitta. So like you have teachers like Ajahn Mahabua, uh, one of the famous Thai teachers who talks about the eternal jitta. Now this, this really annoys the Sri Lankans <laughs> because this is outrageous in terms of Pali Buddhism. The eternal jitta is you know, they won't print its books in Sri Lanka uh, because they, they think this is heresy. Uh, but, but actually, he has a point, you know, from his own experience. He's talking not so much from orthodox Theravada, but from his own, probably his own direct insight. So in, in terms of my insight, also my own direct investigation of Dhamma, I can understand what Ajahn Mahabhu was saying. 
but I can also understand how it doesn't doesn't fit into the uh, the orthodox view of many uh, Sri Lankan Buddhist scholars, because you know you've got an orthodox interpretation of Buddhism that you know tends to almost become rigid, and um, you know because that's how the intellect works. You you fix it into fixed categories and definitions. And then we, we read this, and then we grasp these, these concepts and want to, and try to fit our experience into the concepts from the Pali Canon. And so we tend to, you know, we're, we're struggling with, with, with our own feelings and, it, and, and that in trying to fit them into categories of, the, of how we interpret Pali Buddhism. Now, with Ajahn Chah, he was, he was, he was on, he, his emphasis was on Bhattibhata, on practice. So it was not, Orthodox Buddhism says this, so you have to, you can't, you know, question it. Some will say, the word of the Buddha is sacred and cannot be questioned. And, and so it becomes another belief system. You know, we don't dare question what the Buddha said in the Pali Canon, but he never wrote the Pali Canon, you see. <laughs> so, so how do you know? But anyway, if you take these teachings, the, the, like Four Noble Truths, then this actually you, you put to the test. Uh, and, and always with this reflecting on here and now, Remind yourself, because you, it's so easy to go and think of practice in order to get something in the future. And then if you practice really hard now and you don't get what you're expecting, you're disappointed, you call it bad practice. I had a terrible retreat. I had a good, wonderful retreat. I was just blissed out. I was so happy. <laughs> I had a wonderful retreat. And then you hear people talking like this. And, oh, I spent 10 days in hell. <laughs> Terrible reason. Well, it, it doesn't matter whether wonderful or terrible. These are, this all comes from, uh, you know, what I like and don't like, what I, if I get what I want, a lot of peace and bliss, and I like that. If I don't get that, then I'm miserable. That's all the self view, Sakya Ditti. Because my personality depends on, you know, whether I'm happy or unhappy on the conditions. If I get what I want, I'm happy. And if I don't get what I want, I'm unhappy as a person. And I can see that. I'm aware of that. You know, and, and so the, this, is, this is investigating this sense of, a, of the self, the ego. Till you, you really know it backwards and forwards. So the, the knowing of the ego is not the ego. The consciousness that doesn't arise and cease with the condition is the eternal jitta. Or if you, don't, if you object to that term, it is a matadhamma, or the unconditioned. This is orthodox Buddhism. This is, you know, you can't refute that. Uh, but... Uh, in, in terms of using jitta and eternal, is that's considered by some people heresy or not dhamma or not Buddhist. But and so this is, this is various opinions form around these conventions. But the the point is to make it work so it's liberating. You know, you you can be aware when there's liberation and when there is suffering. You know the difference. So the, the third noble truth is realizing that what has arisen has ceased. And in that cessation, you're still conscious. When, the, you know, when there's anatta, nibbana, shunyata, you're not unconscious. 
you're completely conscious and clear, you know, you're, you're, you're with, you're empty, there's empty, there's no emptiness, there's no self. There's still intelligence, you're, you're bright, your mind is bright and clear. Because you're not attaching to the conditions, to the moods. Even when unclear, confused mental states arise, you have a clarity to see them and not grasp them. So, you know, things, you know, being confused and muddled and, and feeling negativity arises, but there's a clarity around it. I know these states. There's a knowing and, not, and, and, uh, and a reminder not to grasp them anymore. Because you know the result. If I start grasp, just trying to get rid of muddledness or confusion, I get more confused. I know it because I've seen it, I've observed myself trying to get rid of confusion or dullness or sleepiness or, or doubt or worry or things like that. Just by trying to resist and get rid of that, I, it makes it worse. But if I trust this clarity of consciousness, of conscious awareness, then even when the conditions get muddled, there's a, you know, the, the clarity is not muddled. The muddle arises and ceases according to the conditions that that, that comes from. And when the conditions for confusion and muddledness are gone, then it's, it's gone. And there's a knowing of its presence and its absence. This is discernment, or panya, wisdom. You, you know, you recognize conditions as conditions. You, you recognize the unconditioned. So it's not, you don't find it, you recognize it, like space. You say, oh, this is space. So, like you're waking up, and they say space, and then you suddenly recognize space, yes. So, it's like that, you don't find space, you just suddenly wake up and recognize it. Or the unconditioned, it's not that you, you don't have it, or that you can't, or that you're, you, you just wake up, letting go of the condition, you, re- you realize, recognize the unconditioned is this. So this, hopefully, this is an encouragement for you to, you know, to explore, investigate, so that you, you know, we all have our own peculiar karmic conditions to work with. You know, you have to, the way we are and think and and personalities and emotional habits. No, there's no two people are the same. You know, you. So it's not a matter of of you having to be like me, but it's learning to use the way you are. You know, the, the, the body you have, the emotional tendencies, habits that, that, you, that you experience, your fears and desires and so forth, your prejudices, your attachments, all these things, uh, you know, it's not, none of them are obstructions to enlightenment. The only obstruction is ignorance of Dhamma. So, so this is where you think the important issue, like the, the fire in the house, or the arrow, you know, this story of the, ma- the man gets shot by an arrow and he, and uh, before the, the they pull it out. He says, I want to know the make of this arrow, who shot it, his name and address. <laughs> I want to sue him. <laughs> you know, by the time they get all that information, you're dead. <laughs> so the, the aim is to, is to get, you know, get the, get the arrow out. It doesn't matter who shot it or what brand of arrow it is. So this is, uh, 
you know, this, this emphasis I'm making is awakening to, I mean, I'm very direct now because, you know, it's pointing to the, the way you see yourself. I'm an unenlightened person practicing in order to be. Now this is, you know, when we operate from this unchallenged, unrecognized assumption, You know, so then the samatha practices everything. The sila, the dana, everything is done from ignorance. So, you know, you're trying, I remember trying to get jhanas years ago out of, you know, wanting to attain that out of my ego and willfulness, wanting to, to be able to, I've got first jhana. <laughs> and I nearly got the second one the other day. <laughs> And because, you know, my ego feeds on attainment and achievement. So that kind of thing, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm a sotapanna. And uh, because uh, so I took this course and they said, it's a sotapanna, 10-day sotapanna course. Well, I passed it. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a stream emperor. <laughs> <laughs> And that's not useful, you know, that kind of thing. It's ridiculous. But this, this way you're actually starting out from day one, challenging what you think you are. Not denying it, but recognizing why you're here. That, that basic thing that, 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 that you may have never questioned fully or seen as an object, the sense of yourself as somebody who has to do something to get something you don't have yet. Or that you have to, you've come here to get rid of bad habits. To make yourself into uh, a better person. Uh, so this is, not so that, that this emphasis on being aware of this Sakya is is not to deny it, or reject it, but to recognize, like it is like this. And for me, when I did this practice, it became very clear. That's why I can be this competent about it, because, because I've investigated Sakya Ditti, and I see how I, it's always with think, attachment to thinking and, and views and opinions. Now, when I stop thinking, that's why I like the sound of science, because it's Wanting to stop thinking doesn't work. And, and um, just trying to force yourself to stop thinking makes it terrible. And then getting attached to sensory deprivation, because if you just go into a sensory deprivation tank, after a while you get used to it, and there's no sense impingement on you, 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 you can experience bliss, because you're not being stimulated by anything. But can we, do we need to live it like that? Or the Buddha is pointing to suffering, its causes, cessation, and power. So this is not about uh, avoiding or controlling the conditions, but investigating, uh, reflecting on them, and, and seeing, you know, and trusting in this, uh, this natural uh, awareness, sati sampachanya that we can bring to uh, the flow of our lives. You know, it integrates into daily life. It's not dependent on uh, ideal conditions. So I offer this for your reflection. Some
สัมปุทโธปะกะวะบุธรมปะกะวันทังอภิวัตเตมิสวัสดิ์ปะกะวัตธรรมโมธรรมังนมัสสามิสุปฏิปันโนปะกะวะโทสะวะคะสังโฆสังขังนมามิ